When I was in sixth grade, I fell in love. And I fell in love with Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> um, my middle school drama slash religion teacher, Father David, showed our class a movie starring Katherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart called The African Queen. And the moment the movie started, the entire room full of 11 year olds erupted into kids making fun of this middle-aged couple who were talking funny on a boat in Africa. <laughs> and I, on the other hand, was dumbstruck because that woman, Katherine Hepburn, was the most fabulous, fascinating person I had ever seen. And all I wanted to do was yell at those kids to shut up so I could pay attention to that really awesome woman on the screen. But I realized very quickly that that wasn't an option because I was clearly the only kid in the room enjoying the film. Um, but I was so on fire afterwards that I ran up to Father David and asked, had that lady made any more movies? <laughs> and, and he said, yes, she's made a bunch of movies, and encouraged me to go look her up and, and watch some of her films. And that day I went home and watched uh, the Philadelphia Story and Bringing a Baby, in, uh, both in succession. And after that, that sealed the deal for me. I was obsessed with Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> and my only goal in life became to consume anything she had ever been in, made, written, touched. I lived for Katherine Hepburn. And, and the more I watched her films and got to know her, the more I loved her. And I, I loved her because she was everything that I wasn't. She was this strong trailblazer of a woman who was like sexy and respectable and funny all at once. And I was an 11 year old gangly kid who didn't get the memo that in middle school you were supposed to turn into a bitch. So I had no friends. <laughs> and, and I knew that if I could be like even the tiniest bit more like Katherine Hepburn, people would start to like me. Um, and so she kind of, because I, I just consumed so much of what she had written and been in, she kind of started becoming this, this like voice in my head. <laughs> And when I would be nervous, she would tell me to like sit up straight and say something funny. Or, or you know, when I felt like a girl was being mean to me at school, she would tell me to like buck up and get over it. And, and I know this might sound weird, but, but I didn't grow up religious. Um, my mom is Catholic and my dad was raised Jewish and is now a very devout atheist. So they kind of left they kind of left spirituality up to me and whatever I wanted to do. And, and I think Catherine Hepburn was the closest I ever came to feeling a sort of like religious or spiritual faith in, in anything. And that voice in my head sort of became like a moral, a moral compass and like a code for living bravely. <laughs> and and she, she was there with me through like all of adolescence and puberty and like walked me through a lot of important stuff. <laughs> you know, like there, I was, she was there when I was like cute and trying to grow up and writing in my journal about how like everyone was getting boobs, but I wasn't getting boobs. But Catherine Hepburn's boobs weren't that big, so maybe that's okay because she's awesome. <laughs> and, and she was there the first time I called my mom a cunt. <laughs> because I, I was practicing shaking like Catherine Hepburn while I was gardening in the backyard. <laughs> in case you're not familiar, Catherine Hepburn in her older years developed this sort of like uh, Parkinson's like shake. If you, need, if you need an example, I recommend watching On Golden Pond because it's a good movie and she's really shaky in it. Um, and because I wanted to be exactly like Catherine Hepburn, I even wanted to shake like her. And I was pulling weeds and like shaking. And, and my mom saw me from the deck attached to the house and, and, and yells down, Joe, what are you doing? And I freeze. And I'm full of like embarrassment and then rage. And, and then she goes, are you, are you trying to shake like Catherine ever? <laughs> and then I just look back at her and yell, stop being such a cunt. <laughs> Also 
also there for me when I finally started making friends in high school. Um, I, I was a freshman in high school and a new kid who was fabulous, uh, and my first gay friend, Peter, invited me to his birthday party, and he, he clearly invited me because he was new and didn't realize I had no friends, and he offered me my first cigarette. And I don't condone smoking anymore, but when you're 14 and have been obsessed with Katherine Hepburn for the past five years, you've been dying for your first cigarette because she smoked all the time, and she was awesome, and she's super old, so it must be fine. Um, <laughs> So we became smoking buddies and best friends, and we're still friends. Um, so Catherine Hepburn was there through it all. And, and finally, I, I was a senior in high school and on a uh, college tourist trip with my family, and we were staying in Boston. And we had just gotten done with like a big day of touring campuses, and we're back at the hotel getting ready for bed, and I get a text from Peter, and it says, sorry about your girl, frowny face. And I'm like, what could that be? No. <laughs> and I start demanding access to the internet. And my dad is too cheap to buy internet in the room, so I have to take his laptop down to the lobby. So I race down in my PJs, whip open the laptop, go to CNN.com, and the headline reads, Actress Katherine Hepburn dies at age 96. And I read it again, and again, and again. And finally, around like the fifth time, it starts to sink in that that she's really gone. And when, when you become a fan of someone when they're 90 years old, you try to mentally prepare yourself for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nothing, like nothing could have prepared me for that like giant immediate flood of, of like emptiness and loss and I sat there in the hotel lobby in my PJs at 17 tears streaming down my face reading every article I could find and after about an hour I realized that across the lobby in this sort of grand ballroom is this huge wedding reception and there are these people dressed super fancy and having a lot of fun going in and out and I am furious that they can be experiencing joy on like a national tragedy day. <laughs> and, and how could they be so disrespectful? We have lost a treasure and they are experiencing joy. And I'm watching them and just fuming and one of them sees me, it's an older woman, and she comes up to me and asks if I'm okay. And I want to stand up and yell in her face, no, I am not okay, we have lost an icon and you guys are doing nothing about it. But I, I can't say that because I'm a 17 year old girl and her PJ's crying during someone's wedding reception in a hotel lobby. And, and I tell her I lost a friend. And she pats me on my shoulder and tells me it'll be okay. Um, but I know it won't. And I spend about a month after I get home constantly talking about how much I miss Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> and, and my friend Peter finally takes me out to coffee and he's really sweet trying to lift my spirits and he puts his hand on my hand after we sit down and goes, look, I don't, I don't want to be insensitive, but you know you didn't actually know her, right? <laughs> and I sit there for a minute, and then it hits me that I didn't actually know Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> and it sounds super simple, but she had been such a constant presence in, in my head for like six years. She was sort of like my, my Jiminy Cricket, like my conscience. <laughs> And, and I didn't realize that I didn't know her. And then for the first time in about a month since she died, I felt this huge sense of relief because I didn't actually know her. And even though I have learned so much from her and gained so much confidence and, and um, security in myself, really, that was awesome because all of those things I've been attributing to her, I had been slowly cultivating within myself for years. And she didn't do it because I didn't know her. <laughs>